Oh, you think? You know, like that. Yeah. 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 Oh, really? That's right. Yeah. And then I decided to have a Good evening, Portland! <laughs> welcome to the Portland Psychedelic Society. It is our tremendous honor to welcome tonight Eric Davis and Jennifer Dumbert for Liminal Mind. <laughs> I'm Charles, I'm a volunteer here with the Portland Psychedelic Society. We are an all-volunteer run organization that exists to just say no, K-N-O-W, to Psychedelics in Portland. And we are here for you. We are here with community events all over the city. Uh, coming up on August 15th on the west side, we have Breathwork and Inquiry for Personal Transformation. On August 17th, we have a Community Integration Circle. On August 24th, we have a picnic at Laurelhurst Park where you can find the others. So mark that on your calendar. August 24th, 4 p.m., you find the others picnic. And uh, back here at the Clinton Street on September 3rd, we have Jordan Weiss presenting Primordia Emerging, How Mushrooms Are Saving People's Lives. So this is gonna be a really excellent how to, why to, and what to expect when you do kind of a session. So please do come out. Now speaking of what to expect, how to, why to, etc., uh, it's always important at psychedelic events to, to remember and recognize that we are still talking about scheduled substances. So this is all for harm reduction, education, and enlightenment purposes only. We will provide you with amazing information. We will provide you with the access to community, but we will not provide you. Please don't ask your neighbors. Please don't ask your neighbors. Please be cool about it, because that makes sure that the community can continue to do really cool stuff like this. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge just some of the great folks that work behind the scenes to make this happen. Here at the Clinton Street Theater, I want to thank our crew tonight, Pierce, West, and Melissa. Let's have a round of applause for them. <laughs> the Portland Psychedelic Society is run by some really hardworking volunteers. I want to thank uh, Dan, who's doing our uh, camera work tonight. I'd like to thank also our former directors, Leia, Willis, Ashton, Nathan, Jennifer, Joe, Jason, and Evan. Let's have a round of applause for the people who are here. If you want to be a volunteer, we want to work with you. Come find us at this table over here at the end of the night. Uh, not only can you get one of these amazing Portland Psychedelic Society t-shirts like I'm wearing for a $20 donation, but you can also find out about how to volunteer and how to be involved in some of our future events. Uh, one of the more exciting future events is Save the Date for October 26th. At Revolution Hall, we have the second Portland Psychedelic Conference. Uh, we're really excited to be hosting James Fadman, Kalina Igi, Rachel Harris, Andrea Ward, Meryl Ward, and many, 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 many more. You can get your tickets now, and I'll get out of the way of the slide there. You can see where you can find us, where you can get your tickets. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, we are on Meetup. So please do make a point of checking it out. And I gotta say that this event would not be possible, not just without the community of volunteers and community of folks here, but without the community making handshakes and saying, hey, I think that uh, there's somebody that would be great for this. So I wanna give a really big shout out to Na Young, who made this whole thing possible by setting us up with American Jennifer. Thank you so much for making this possible. So it's a real honor tonight to have two of the finest authors working in the contemporary psychedelic and consciousness space. Uh, both of these books are available here. You should get your copies, you should get them signed. Uh, Jennifer's Liminal Dreaming is a really extraordinary examination of the variety of consciousness states. And she tells these things not like a lot of these books are, where it's a lot of really dry stuff written by somebody whose credentials are questionable, but she's telling this from somebody who really knows their stuff, 
who's really well informed, and who's writing it for human beings. There's a lot of really great personal experience in here in a way that is connecting with me on a deep heart level as a reader and will connect with you as well. It's gonna be a real pleasure to work with her tonight and to hear what she has to say. Uh, Eric Davis's High Weirdness, uh, Drugs, Esoterica, and Visionary Experience in the 1970s is gonna be the textbook that we refer to in the 2040s when the dominant thinkers in the culture have changed from the Philip K. Dick, Jack Kirby world we're living in right now to the Terrence McKenna, Ursula K. Le Guin world that we're gonna be living in then. <laughs> <laughs> this book goes into Terrence McKenna, Robert Anton Wilson, and Philip K. Dick, and the culture of the 1970s fringe, weirdo, science fiction, drug, California culture and its impact on then and now. It is a riveting read. It is also a read that you feel guilty if you're reading it for credentials because he has credentials out the wazoo and you've got the references in here, but it's just a really terrific read by one of the finest minds. So uh, please join me in giving a warm Portland Psychedelic Society welcome to Jennifer So I've seen the whole scene change dramatically, of course, now over, over you know, almost 20 years. Uh, and it's funny, I think the, the, what, I, what I'm coming to increasingly is that I'm kind of less interested in psychedelic experience per se, and I'm more interested in psychedelic people and how people live psychedelic lives in and outside of their relationships or uh, their experiences with entheogens. And I think both of our books really speak to this kind of larger sense of psychedelic, although my book really goes into some detail about, quite, quite a lot of detail about how to think about really, really wild trips and experiences. I'm still coming from that deeper, broader sense, and Jennifer, definitely, in terms of what does it mean to live a psychedelic life? How do we approach experience, daily life, altered states of consciousness, subtle and not so subtle? with the psychedelic uh, attitude. So we did not intend to have our books come out at the same time, uh, but they did. <laughs> they, they, you know, they came out in, in May uh, this year, and we've uh, been mostly doing events uh, uh, alone, but we've done a couple of things together. And tonight's the first time where we kind of decided to come together and actually have a conversation, you know, about the books, but also about what, uh, what they share. And because, of course, they both come out of conversations that she and I have been having uh, over for a very long period of time. And, uh, and, and so we really hung it on this idea of, of liminality, uh, the in-between, the threshold space. Um, and, uh, you know, we can, I'll get into more about how I've been inspired by the liminal uh, in terms of approaching psychedelic experience, approaching uh, intellectual work, approaching the problem of how, we, how do we think about these kinds of experiences. But I thought we would just talk, start out talking a little bit about liminality in general. Um, it's, a, it's a term, you know, it can mean m many different things, but again, the in-between or the threshold is kind of the best way of thinking about it. It's the in-betwixt, in-between, the, the, the twilight zone, if you will. Um, and one way of thinking about, or one aspect of liminality that's very important to me and, and the story I'm telling here, and to some degree, psychedelic culture and how it's changing, is that at least tradition, at least in the West for a long time, psychedelics have been liminal, meaning that they were in the margins, they were on the edge, they were not in the mainstream, they were someplace you had to go to, you had to move into a sort of, you know, here be dragons, like at the edge of medieval maps. Uh, kind of space in order to find the others. You know, that's where the others were, is that they were in the margins. And one thing that unites all the three 
uh, dead white guys that I talk about <laughs> in my book is that they were all very deeply marginal in, in their social location, their income, their attitudes, uh, you know, at a time when there were a lot of people who were really rejecting the mainstream and in fact couldn't really even find their way back if they wanted to because the times were so uh, unusual, so, so bizarre in the 1970s. So we're, we're going to something very different now where the margins are starting to come inside the mainstream, so it's a very interesting time to think about the liminal. What does it mean to be on the outside or be on the margins or be on the in-between? And what does it mean to like kind of weave those ideas and inspirations into more direct engagements with uh, mainstream society, if that's part of what we're, what we're doing about. Um, but Jennifer actually has the word in the title of her book, Liminal Dreaming, and so she has a very specific sense of liminality. So, I mean, I'm curious, like, Talk about you know what what you're talking about in dreaming that you're calling liminal dreaming because it's a term you came up with to describe something that people don't really generally think about or even kind of acknowledge or even necessarily aware of at least conceptually. Uh, so talk about that, but then also what what was it about the tag liminal that uh, that drew you to this? So the word I, I like etymology because I think it says a lot. The word liminal comes from the Latin word linen, which means threshold or doorway. It's where we get words like limit. I've got, as somebody who's been working in dream space for a very long time, five or six years ago, I started to pay attention to that dream space that happens when you're falling asleep. And I thought, wow, oh, everyone's talking about this. And I've always been someone who spends, you know, Lucky is my life. I don't have to be anywhere at particular time very often. I spend a lot of my life, an hour in bed in the morning, in that kind of halfway thinking dream state. And I start to think these are dream states that no one is talking about, but everybody goes through. So, uh, liminal dreams are the dreams, it's the dream space that happens between awake and asleep. You all know it. When you're falling asleep, it's hypnagogia. And when you're waking up, it's hypnopompia. And the thing that distinguishes liminal dream states is that you are unconscious and you're dreaming, but you're also conscious. Your waking mind is online. You know you're lying on your bed. You can hear the clock strike six and you're like, oh, it's six o'clock. You can hear what somebody is saying near you. You can follow their conversation at the same time that you're unconscious and you're having a dream. So you all know, you're falling asleep and your leg jerks or your arm jerks or you maybe you hear an alien radio station or somebody whispering your name or maybe you're reading a book and then you start to be like, oh, why is my grandmother in this book? <laughs> you're like, oh, right, that's, I've, I've actually not fallen asleep with the book, or you're, you're like waking up for something, you're hopefully not driving, but it does happen, <laughs> and you're starting to go into that hallucinatory part. Right, this is hypnagogia, you all know it. Hypnopompia is the one you're, you're waking up very slowly, and you feel like you've begun to think, and then you realize what was an idea is actually partly a dream. You're kind of going back and forth between the space. It's a brainwave states, and there are only so many brainwave states that we go through in a day. It's a brainwave state marked by EEG that everyone goes through, but nobody talks about it. And most of you, uh, probably when I was giving you an articulation, I was like, oh yeah. One of the best things about the little dream states, especially hypnagogia, as you're falling asleep, is that all 95% of you, if you do not already spend some time in there and they're like, wow, I didn't do that, I didn't realize that was a thing, you're gonna have this experience now in the next week because we all go through it. You're gonna be like, oh, that's what that lady was talking about. Her dream state. But it's a really remarkable thing because you're in the unconscious, you're in dream space, but you have waking mind online, so you can be watching what's happened. It takes very little training to learn to locate and linger 
in the liminal dream space and to watch what's in your own consciousness start to unfold in amazing ways, non-narrative, free associative, often often absence of ego. You're not, that's not a me in a world. REM dreams, lucid dreams, which are different from liminal dreams. In both those cases, you're still you moving through the world. You might be, you know, on, on, on the moon with your whale forefathers who you always knew he could talk to you when you're all you know, getting together to put on a show or whatever. But you feel like it's credible at the moment that you're in it. You're in this other world that you believe that you're in. Whereas in the liminal dream space, you know where you are, and yet all of this stuff is fluttering up. And there's all sorts of things that people do with it. It's visionary experience, it's great for creativity, it's great for problem solving. The periodic table was conceived in a little dream. You know, the, um, the benzene ring was understood in a little dream, you know, et cetera. A lot of people use this space, but I, I love talking to, to audiences like you because one of the things that I can say is for consciousness exploration, this is a really amazing and tricky space. Yeah, that's what we were talking about before about, you know, being a psychedelic person. I think part about being a psychedelic person is to have a, a part of you going a lot of the time that's aware about how your your phenomenal the phenomenological experience of the world is partly being constructed through your nervous system and to sort of bring that self-awareness into your experience and liminal dreaming for me it, it was really wonderful to like i think like a lot of you like i i was i had experiences like this but i just never really thought about them i just or i didn't i didn't put them anywhere i didn't have anywhere to put them and i actually had quite a number of really extraordinary not quite paranormal, but very bizarre experiences that occurred in this little space. But as was Jennifer was doing more research on it, I became a little bit more conscious of it. And just to give you an example of, 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 of kind of what I'm talking about and, and, and represents this sort of this two states where you're sort of aware of your own unconscious, is I was you know napping in the afternoon, which is a really good time to explore this, this kind of space. And my eyes were closed, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of here, just sort of staring into that dark, misty sky, night sky of your closed eyelids, you know, the, the closed, like before the closed eye visuals kick in, that kind of space. And I was just kind of hazy a little bit, and then I kind of noticed there were these little phosphines going off, you know, perfectly natural, physiological effects of the visual system, closed eyes, you know, a little bit of, like a little bit of a twinkly stars in the night sky. And then I was like, oh wow, I'm, I'm this is pretty clear. And then as I watched it, there were three of them and they became a triangle. And I'm like, whoa, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and then like, and then oh, like I'm, I'm awake, for, I'm, I'm watching this thing happen. And then the triangle became a, uh, a pyramid, boom, boom. And then the pyramid became an object in an immense, desert landscape with these little dudes going along in, on camels. And I'm just watching this whole thing, like knowing that this is my mind doing it. And so there's a sense, and that to me that's a very kind of psychedelic perspective, because it's not just that you're having a vision, it's that you're aware you're having a vision, and that part of the vision, a lot of the vision, is the construction of your own nervous system in kind of a visionary uh, imaginative mode. And one of the really cool things about this book is it sort of get, get, it, it, it reminds you of things you already know, and then it gives you like all these practices to work with this, with this material, because as she says, it's way easier than lucid dreaming. And we've all wanted a lucid dream, we've had lucid dreams, some of you are probably lucid dream practitioners. It's really hard, it's really hard to do. But this realm is a lot more Available, right? It is because everybody is a natural liminal dreamer. And when I'm talking to different audiences, I often talk about the ways that you can use liminal dreaming, creativity, problem solving, whatever. But um, for me, a lot of it is just, it's very psychedelic. And as um, as we sort of go through what people are calling the second renaissance of, of psychedelic culture, my this book, blah, you know, my, my, you know, my aunt. You know, my you know, my straight relatives are like, oh, I understand I'm on the board of Ehrlich. I understand that Ehrlich thing, you know, oh my god, I've got all this book. You know, so now suddenly it's like become this kind of mainstream thing. And people either people who are interested in the psychedelic experience but might not want to step into something that's either really strong or illegal, or people who have 
done a lot of psychedelics in their life and want to have experiences that are really psychedelic, this is, this is an amazing doorway into those kinds of things. And just to give you, I mean, I can, I can go on at great length in this, but just to give you a, a couple of examples. Um, I have learned to uh, touch type when I'm in hypnagogia. So I can go into like a hypnagogic dream space of a good touch typer, and then I can you know, type what the experience is of what, what's happening to me in there, and then, and then read them in this, this, this crazy free associative world of my own memories and associations and um, you know, sort of dream perceptions. And so I, I see this swirl of my own consciousness that, I think this is gonna sound familiar to some of you, is this kaleidoscopic free associative world you know, that, I'm, that is moving so fast it's really hard to track any one particular thing, like these little through lines of like zinging off to these childhood memories of all these associations of things I've read, right? Um, I can also, uh, I, I've been experimenting with how many different dreams I can run at once. Um, six, I'm at six. So I can have six different dream tracks where it's pulled out totally different worlds. You know, there's like this melting sci-fi city in pastel colors over here. And over here, there's a rack of 70s satanic records on the strip of lawn to my grandparents' house and the street. And I can look through and see each album cover. And I can go into each world in infinite detail and then pull out and hold them all at once. I mean, and this is some really trippy. <laughs> and it's just there in your mind, and you realize that those liminal zones between um, waking thought and dreaming thought, you know, between you know this the this waking mind that I have right now and other modes of consciousness that I've experienced not only in dreams but in other kinds of experiences, and you can actually start to hold them all at the same time. And if you're somebody who has any kind of experience. I, either playing with sort of psychedelic spaces or even just playing with your own weird mind spaces through dreams or through other kind of subtle allies, which is another thing that we like to talk about, then you're really primed for this kind of work because you really know how to trap those liminal zones. Yeah, it was really helpful for me too when I was doing doing my book because you know basically what the book is is it's a it, it kind of sets up the, the the psycho landscape of the 1970s and the, the, the counterculture the end of the kind of the drift of the counterculture through a very dark and weird time and then i look at these extreme experiences that terence mckenna robert anton wilson and philip k dick have and, and it, with with mckenna and wilson it's very much about psychedelics these guys are prometheans they're taking very large doses in order to get to the very edge of things to see how far they can they can take the mind and to see what what lies there but philip k dick the science fiction writer that you know people know best because he wrote the book that they made blade runner on but he's a great author i'm sure some of you out there are, are familiar and probably there's some dickheads out there. Um, sorry, believe me, I've been getting it for decades. But um, big scholar, big scholar, yeah. And, um, so uh, with with with, with PKD, it's more internal. You know, I mean, he did use drugs, he did try psychedelics, but he wasn't a big head, and he wasn't exactly desiring to bring these on. He was morally more of a visionary on the Natch, and his big experience in 1974. Uh, 2374 is what he called it. It's this kind of half psychotic, half religious visionary experience. He starts having these paranormal experiences, dreams, synchronicities, messages in his head, uh, beams of light, te temporal breakdowns where like 1974, uh, Orange County becomes Rome and 50 AD and like Christ is coming back and all this like stuff that in another, another person's head would be pretty much just crazy. Uh, but it, Dick is brilliant, so it, it becomes this really rich story. But when I started to look, and there's some real uh, familiar elements of this, if you know this story or in some of the books that he wrote later in his life about this, like uh, Ballas or his uh, exegesis, which is this private uh, document that he wrote to try to figure out the meaning of these experiences, because it's kind of like he got a revelation but never really figured out the message. And 
So there's some very famous parts of the story, but the more I went into it and I was reading his letters and reading the exegesis and trying to put together what is he actually doing, I realized that it wasn't just happening to him spontaneously, that he was also practicing with it. Not by, say, taking drugs and trying to explore it, but frankly by moving into hypnagogia. And I, I was, oh wait, that's what he's doing in this thing. And so what he would do is he had the belief that something was talk, trying to talk to him through his dreams. And so he would go to sleep and listen for the voices. And he would get these snippets of dream talk that he would then write down and try to figure out what they meant. And then he would use those to try to figure out his other visionary experiences. So if you're familiar with this uh, work, there are certain phrases. There's a phrase, for example, perturbations of the reality field which is actually a pretty good description of a lot of the edge of things. So when, when the world gets liminal, it gets a little bit like, well, here's reality, but it's kind of rippling in a weird way that I'm not exactly sure what's going on. It's a cool phrase. He uses it a lot. That was something he snatched out of hypnagogia. And in his notebooks, he would even write hypnagogia, colon, and he'd write the sentence down. So it really was a great example of what Jennifer's talking about is that if you approach the state with the mind of practice, not just of like, oh, I'm going on a trip, but like, here I am, I'm working with the state, I'm working with my mind in relationship to it, it begins to talk back, or to feed back, or to express itself. And when we're talking about liminal mind, we really are, in a lot of ways, talking about practices, uh, whether it's actually, so um, I'm kind of very practical lady, uh, my book has a lot of actual exercises in it, beginner's exercises for learning to locate linger in the space, a lot of things that you can do with a lot of ways that you can use it. But we're a, a real, in our household for a really long time, we're really very much focused on the idea of these practices. And as people at a, a, a psychedelic society uh, meeting, you probably all understand what it means to make something a practice. Right? How? What's the practice of going in and and finding these these liminal zones? So, so the idea of imagination as a faculty of perception. Like, how do you start to think about imagination as a faculty of perception? The Sufi idea of mundus imaginalis, you know, or the um, the idea that I means so part of the liminal is uh, between you and the world. We I'm going to really steal your your auditory thing, but it makes sense. But, um, we've been talking about uh, about practices or modes of perception that are the liminal, and a really great example is sound, right? So sound happens over there. Sound waves travel through the air. They enter my ear, and then my brain interprets them and does a little thing. So where is the sound happening? Is it over there? Is it in here? It's this kind of liminal zone, right, between me and the world. Vision is the same way. I write about this in the book. Vision is the, you know, if you think about vision, we tend to really privilege vision. Oh, I see. You know, as opposed to dream or imagination. Oh, you just dreamt that. Oh, that's only your imagination. But in a lot of ways, you're, you're actually using imagination when in vision. As you know, the visual sensorium is huge. There's way more than you can take in. Um, and so your, what you expect to see, what you imagine is there, your brain is gonna fill in. So even vision is actually a liminal experience between you and the rest of the world. So you can talk about it in those like, materialistic terms, and then you can start to filter it down into these practices, like these practices like what Dick was using, or what I use, and the liminal being my sort of mode of meditation now. How do I you know, find this kind of space between me and other, between waking and sleeping, and what is the mind doing in there? Yeah, I mean, one of the, I think, great images of, of, the, of liminal mind that you also talk about in your book is, is twilight. I mean, it's an amazing thing when you think about it. Like, you know, we've been a lot, some of us have been around for a while, and you know, like, you know, running five decades plus over here. And it's still the case that when, sun, when, when the magic hour comes and sunsets, the sun starts to go down and I'm looking at you know, a gritty urban environment, 
suddenly there's a charm to the air. There's a kind of sense of magic, as if something sort of special is going on, or the sky lights up, or there's that sense of childhood, or distant landscapes. There's a kind of magic in the air for a short period of time at the point between, in the liminal space between day and night. And that's not just you know, specific to that condition. I think it points to something that's generally true, which is you get to the magic when you get, to get in between the dominant you know, uh, categories of the things that you're, that you're playing with. And so in, in some ways we're like, how do you encourage yourself to exist or to play with that twilight space to recognize that there's always kind of, you know, a thread of twilight in, in, in what's going on. Um, and to stay with that point on uh, what, we, what I thought about when you were talking about the sound, the sound is like, what is it in my head or is it out in the world? It's both, it's neither. So, you know, I am the world. But it's not in a simple way, like, oh, I'm just one with everything. And people talk about that. They talk about it with psychedelic experiences, transpersonal experiences, I'm connected with everything. What I talk about in my book, when I'm really looking closely at these really extraordinary experiences, is that it's, it's not just like a, a, a simple connection between me and the world. It's more like a loop, like a Mobius loop, where the thing about the Mobius loop, which is just you know, a physical object, you can make one, just twist the paper, and there you go, you got a Mobius loop, is that it doesn't have an inside or an outside, or it is both an inside and an outside. And so here we have a nice physical, mathematical object, topological object, we can say, yes, reality is kind of like that, <laughs> where what we think of as the inside is actually the outside, and what we experience on the outside is actually the inside, but they're constantly turning and twisting, it's like we're, we're riding it. And I think psychedelic experience very much makes that evident. And that's one of the things I try to do in the book is to track how these elements from the environment, from the, the, the backgrounds, the reading, the influences, the cultural influences that, that are surrounding these people, turn, twist around and become the very intimate heart of their experiences. And similarly, how these profound states of consciousness they achieve inside transform the world so that then the world is no longer what we kind of think it is. So liminality is not just like a static place in between. It's being willing to kind of ride the Mobius loop that links these two different realms. So liminal mind is a, uh, a phrase that I came up with while I was writing the book. And I ended up talking about liminal mind a lot in the book. It was completely a side effect. I didn't expect that. I thought I was just talking about liminal dreaming. And as I was going really deep into these spaces and doing these practices, because this is my main meditation practice now, going into the you know, dream space and posting that space between awake and the sleep and seeing what arises, leveling through voice activated recorders or you know, that kind of thing, I started to see this feedback loop, this Mobius loop, that was happening between me and the world. Psychogeography is the term for your relation, your specific relationship to the space in which you're moving, right? So if you're moving through the city, you have your own mental map, right? I mean, right now, think about how, what it means, how you get from your home in your, in your mind. So you're probably uh, going, you're going through some different kinds of landmarks. Oh, these particular trees, I turn left here. There's that building that stands out for me, right? What you see is different from what even a person you live with would maybe give a different description, right? And this street corner is where something really relevant happened to me. This one has historicity, something historic happened here. So there's actually a loop between you and the city. I actually was using the city as a dream journal for a while by um, visualizing my dream in the architecture so that, uh, you know, so that my eye passing over the architecture would recreate the dream. So as I walked around in my neighborhood, it became more and more layered with my dreams, right? So sort of psychogeography of, you know, the fact that the city, the, the, the space that I'm in is not just the other, the space and me. Like the meaning, which is something that we're constructing, the meaning of the space, or what I, how I understand the space, is a feedback loop between me and the space. The space doesn't care if I'm not there. If I'm not in the city, then my psychogeography isn't really there. 
right? But as long as I'm moving through it, there is a liminal zone between me and it, which is a, a thing when you start, that if you start practicing in the liminal dream space or start thinking about liminal mind, you'll start to really have a deeper understanding of what that space is. Now, I'm not talking about the, the purity of the new age creating your own reality, because it's, that, that breaks apart. Once you're, the piano falls on your head, it kills you. It doesn't matter what you're envisioning in your life. You know, so, but there's, there's a certain degree to which there is a feedback loop between you and the world around you. And like the sound, what, what, what's really happening isn't in you and it isn't over there. It's this feedback loop. And another route into the liminal mind that, that makes me think of is the, the, the phrase entre chien et lieu, which you talk about in relationship to, to twilight. And this is between, French for between the, the wolf and the dog. And what it's referring to is there's, a, so if you think more about the, the model of twilight, why is twilight enchanted? Why does it feel enchanted? And let's put on, you know, neurocognitive sciences, science, neuroscientists hat. Um, doesn't really look like this. Uh, uh, this is a little too hip for that, but well, um, well, whatever, you know. Uh, why, why does that happen? Well, because there is a decrease in visual feedback because of the changing in the light, so that your mind fills in what you're seeing more. And so that object, that you know, uh, rustling object, four, four-legged object on the horizon, is it a dog or is it a wolf? I can't quite tell. I'm in a space of ambiguity. My imagination is trying to fill things in. And of course, as human beings, we have a tremendous desire to, to know, to go, to be, to be certain. It's a dog, it's a wolf. And part of liminal mind, a really key part of it, and I think a really key part of psychedelic practice and cannabis practice that not enough people do, is to be okay, in fact, embrace the ambiguity of the experience. Don't try to resolve it into, oh, this is going on, or this is going on or this means this, this symbol means this. Instead, become aware of the openness of experience and the multiple levels uh, that, it, that it possesses. There's an idea that I talk about, and this is a lot of what I'm trying to do in the book, is to say like, what do we do with these completely wild experiences that have paranormal elements in them, that are just so over the top, and that often include you know, like contacts with entities. All three of the guys that I talk about have these contacts with extraterrestrials or some other voice in their head, some, you know, higher mind. You know, how do we talk about those? Because the standard thing, the, the, the two sides, the night and day, the night and day is the day says, oh, it's just your brain, just a hallucination, it's just a psychopathology, you know, we can explain it with a neurological language, cognitive science, a misfire, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, agency detection is a term, if you know your cognitive science, to explain why we might see entities uh, in trees or rock faces or hear voices in our head. Or that there's the night side, which is like, it's all true. <laughs> there's multiple dimensions of reality, and entities are communicating with me about the history of the world, and my own <laughs> special role in telling people about this. <laughs> and so what do you do if you reject the night and reject the day? Well, then you're stuck in the twilight, but it's a wonderful place to be. And so what I try to do in the book, using a lot of you know heavy-duty scholarly tools, but also using my own imagination and my own commitment to uh, evocative writing is to try to like occupy that middle space. What if we think hard about these things, but we don't reduce them? We, we respect neurological cognitive explanations, but we don't reduce them to that. And at the same time, rejecting, let's call it religious or metaphysical thinking, which also has a place. These are meta metaphysical ideas that they're playing with. It's a metaphysical world that we're in, but let's not be, become certain Let's not see that as like some explanation. Let's instead try to ride this middle zone where we're just not really sure what's going on and that's okay. One of the things I talk about, I quote is, uh, if you ever studied English literature as, as I did, you might have stumbled across this notion that the romantic poet John Keats had. And that's a very famous idea in literary studies. It's called negative capability. And what he was talking about was the power of some authors, Shakespeare was an example for him, 
who are able, and I'm not going to, I'm going to misquote it, but it's basically being able to be in the midst of confusions, ambiguities, and mysteries without, and this part is right, any irritable reaching after fact or reason. <laughs> so that is liminal mind. And that is something that I believe psychedelics don't necessarily take us to, because some people take them as just hedonistic, you know, maximizers of sensory uh, experience and just sort of weird, you know, okay, fine, whoa, it's wild, you know, they're not necessarily reflecting on the meaning of it, or they see it as some kind of truth <clears throat> that it's going to take them and give them messages from the beyond or from the jungle or whatever the thing is. But I think the practice of psychedelics is precisely in more and more intelligently entering into this liminal space. But it's not just about drugs, it's about dreaming, it's about uh, relating with all sorts of psychoactives in our lives, from tea to you know, bug wars and some of the other things that you talk about as, as sort of dream enhancers. So I, I really think the, the liminal is a, is a wonderful way to explore a lot of things that are going on and it's something we should be, uh, become more comfortable with or more familiar with, I should say, because it's not very comfortable. As we as we you know continue to plunge into an extremely weird time in history, where a lot of in betweens are opening up in between other in betweens, and uh, we're trying to navigate through it all. It's a bit it's a bit much sometimes, but uh, here's some you know handy handy navigational tips. With liminal dreaming, with hypnagogia and hypnopatia, um, again, it's a thing that everybody experiences, but a lot of people. Think of it as the way station. I'm awake or I'm asleep. You know, I'm, I'm moving through this space, but it's just a space I'm moving through from one state to another. We're, in a lot of ways, we're encouraged to think about things in a very black and white way. We think of consciousness as on off, right? Zero, one, you're awake or you're asleep. But in fact, there's an enormous continuity of consciousness between these two states. There's a lot that happens on the, on the journey between one and the other. And the longer I get into this practice, the more I've been able to pull this apart, like the four distinct stops between awake and asleep that are like areas where I can linger. The more I spend in it, the more I start to learn. And in both my own experience, when I started paying attention to these dreams after, <coughs> these kinds of dreams after decades of dream work, and often when I talk to other people, um, rather than you know, going from the one space to the other space, from the zero, from the one. So thinking about that, it, stopping and lingering in these weird between spaces. And so, and actually, they're very strange. I mean, liminal dreams, the dream, liminal dreaming and your are funny, both objectively and subjectively. Objectively, just to give you a little riff on this, um, most of our, of, if you measure brains by electricity, EEG, most of our brainwave states are, are marked by like like a sine wave. You're in deep sleep, you know, and you're going like you know 0.5 to three, very slow. We're here, we're very engaged, we're in beta, we're going from like you know 13 to 40 faster theta, which is what most of our sleep is, where deep meditators go, has two kind of waves. Hypnagogic spaces have six. They're by far the shortest brainwave state that we go through. We all go through them. But there's like six different, there's, it's chaos, basically. Your brain waves are going crazy, which is why your leg jerks, your arm jerks, your body is doing the same thing as your brain waves. So if you think about, um, if you think about like consciousness as land and um, unconscious as water, pretty common images, where water hits land is where it's chaotic, it's where there's all these waves, like in hypnagogic and hypnopathia, that's where you surf. Right, so surfing consciousness is like very much in this very in this in this state. So part of liminal dreaming is starting to recognize these in between spaces, and instead of like moving from your point A to your point B, lingering in these in between spaces and starting to look around and see what that is. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things that I've developed through you know being bringing more consciousness to. Dream to sleeping, but particularly napping, because it's, I think it's, it's easier to focus on it, is you know how when you wake up, sometimes you don't know where you are, especially when you travel or you're in a different, like taking a nap in a different part of your house, you wake up and there's that moment of like, I don't know where I am. 
is that I've, I've learned to like extend that and enjoy it incredibly, you know, so that I can actually be for like 30 seconds like, wow, I really enjoy it. I really, I have no fucking idea where my body is. This is awesome. You know, and it's, but, there, but there's also the urge, like, this is freaky, man. You got to figure it out. Like, no, no, it's good. Bring it on. More, more freaky. And, you know, we're using these words, and Jennifer just talked about it's a very weird space. And, you know, one of the things that I did, that I was trying to do with, with high weirdness is, is to take this term weird seriously. We all use it. We all use it all the time. Daily, you know, daily, weekly, whatever. Where, you know, it's a weird guy, weird experience, weird situation, weird movie. You know, and it means good, bad. It's kind of like, it's a, it's a very ambiguous term. Sometimes it's really cool, sometimes not so cool. And that's really key, that ambiguity and even the, the desirability of it. It's a little repulsive, it's a little exciting. For me, psychedelics have a lot of weirdness in them. And so, as does a lot of the kind of cultural stuff that has influenced me. Magic, H.P. Lovecraft, science fiction, uh, underground comics, uh, heavy metal. A lot of these things like play with the weird, which is sort of like the enchanted, but also includes the dark side, but isn't like totally evil or anything. It's kind of somewhere in between. And uh, so what I'm trying to do is to say that the weirdness actually gives us a handle to understand an aspect of psychedelics and psychedelic experience and psychedelic culture very much that are kind of getting swept under the carpet a little bit now because everybody's so quick to talk about healing and to talk about um, integration and to, and to sort of, frankly, kind of utopianize some of these substances at a point where we are in a mental health crisis, there's a lot of problems, psychedelics are really powerful medicines, they can be really great healing things, but we can't sort of, we shouldn't pretend that they're not as weird as they are, which they are. Um, so this is kind of my attempt to sort of bring this sort of back in and to say, no, 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 but we can think really, we can take weirdness really seriously as not just a kind of cultural reference, like a weird story or, or the sense of, a, you know, that, that kind of am ambiguity of is, is this, you know, like a face in a, in a cloud can be a little threatening and then it's kind of exciting and you're like wants to tell you something and it's kind of weird. Uh, uh, but also as, um, as, a, as a feature of reality. I, uh, you know, I, I did, I do this etymology at the beginning of the book where I talk about the history of the word weird. Where does it come from? You know, and then Shakespeare calls the sisters in Macbeth the weird sisters and then the romantic poets start to use the term more and start, starts to be spooky and atmospheric. And so you can really kind of trace a whole history of experience by tracing this word. And then I come to the 1970s and that, that's the 1970s is when people first start using the term weirdness to talk about quantum physics. They talk about quantum weirdness. And they still talk about quantum weirdness. There's a new book by Edward Ball that's called Beyond Weird about quantum physics because it's become such a term where it's like basically the argument is, is if quantum physics is true, and there's no reason to believe that it isn't based on experimental evidence, uh, that reality is really, really fucking weird, like way weirder. Like it's not like this causal, you know, space-time cruise thing that we're kind of locked in. It's very different than that. And so the fact that people reach for the word weird to describe it is really significant for me, and, and, and particularly in this context, for, for one particular reason. Is that a lot of the w words we use to talk about the non-rational, uh, supernatural, uh, enchanted, mystical, uh, magical, like a lot of those words imply a kind of non-materialist other, like another dimension, like we're, we're inside of rational space-time here that science can talk about, but then there's this other place, this other domain. Uh, and what I like about weird and why the quantum physics folks grabbed onto weird is that we all know how weird the world can get, even if we don't believe in any of those explanations. It's like if you have a prophetic dream, you have a dream, the next day it comes true. You know, there's some lady crossing the the street and she's got an orange hat and it's totally bizarre and like stops in the middle of the street and freaks out and you're like, and then the next day it happens, you're like, oh my God, I, I wrote it down and everything. Oh my God, okay. Well, if you don't believe that whatever, uh, God is, in, is writing your experience or that the, the universe is actually just all happening at once or some strange metaphysical idea that you're really attached to, if, if you are like most of us and you're like, 
I don't know what's really going on. I mean, I have a suspicion it's this, but I'm not really sure, or it might be that, you know, more a kind of secular, free-thinking mindset. That's an event like that, a paranormal experience, a sense of telepathy, some str a s strange series of synchronicities. I keep seeing number 23 all through the day. What's going on here? Is somebody trying to tell me something? I, that doesn't make any sense, but something's happening. That kind of stuff, we all know about it. If we're, if we're describing it to ourselves or to other people, what's, what, do we, how, what do we say? We say, yeah, it's weird. It's really weird because we all know what that means. And we don't have to invoke any gods or metaphysical bizarre cosmologies or, or mystical dimensions of the world to acknowledge that sometimes in quantum physics and in human lives, and certainly in dreams, and certainly in psychedelics, things get weird. Well, let's, let's look at that. That's part of our world. Let's affirm that that is part of our world. It's part of what we're playing with. And especially at a time when things are getting weirder. I mean, not necessarily in a particularly cool way. In fact, a lot of it is sort of banal. We're like in a weird, banal, weird thing that's going on where it's really sort of tacky and depressing, but it's also completely strange, and it's just gonna get stranger. So it's like there's a certain familiarity with the weird that I think psychedelics are, are really beneficial for in a way that we don't really talk about because it's not really part of the mainstream discourse. And there's a lot of what I was trying to do uh, with this thing, and it's a lot about what I love about what you're doing and the, these kinds of practices. Yeah, and so we want to leave a bunch of time for um, questions for y'all. So um, let's close this with, um, so we're both on book tour, we have been all summer, um, and tonight is, is, is a very different event from a lot of the other events that we're doing. We're mostly going somewhere and talking about our books and sort of doing the same thing. Tonight is a very, you know, we decided to open this up and do something interesting, but I just want to close with each of us, I just want to tell you a little bit about what's actually happening in my book, and then we can do the same, and then we'll take a bunch of questions. So, um, my book is designed to be read really in any order. It's in two halves. The first half is both the subjective and the objective uh, study of liminal dream space. It talks to you about how, what the experience is like, if you're having it, it talks about the science behind it, gives you a lot of exercises for learning to go into it. Again, you all can find it probably pretty easily, but you can really learn to, to spread it out. Most of us naturally only spend like four to eight minutes. I can, I can spend hours in this space now. I can drop into it pretty much at will. So it gives you some exercises to start to really kind of go into the space. That's the first half. The second half is a series of um, sort of short essays all on different ways that people in different cultures have used liminal dreaming. And it also has a lot of practices that you can try yourself if you want to use a bunch of them. And I'm going to give, give you just a quick rundown. Um, there's a chapter on Antoshiani Loop, on understanding you know, perception of liminal mind. Uh, there's a chapter on dream time cartography and cognitive liberty. Uh, both about learning to sort of map space in the way that you start to map psychedelic experiences that you go into, and also cognitive liberty because as it happens, and I worry a little bit about being a gentrifier, as it happens, nobody right now is talking about what happens in liminal dream space. So it's one of the only mind spaces that we have where there's no marketing. Right now, there are no marketing tendrils that are trying to go into your get the dodge and get the pop, yeah. So, you're hearing me talk about it right now, but otherwise there's not a lot of people telling you what you're going to experience. So it's almost like great political action to go into these spaces, because you really can go, even psychedelic spaces have marketing around them. Um, imagination is a faculty of perception, and I'm talking about Jung and active imagination, and the Sufi idea of mundus imaginalis, uh, sleep paralysis. I'm talking about um, psychopomp, um, a lot of people who are dying are actually going through hypnagogia, uh, and I've, I've worked with a doctor in Buffalo who's, uh, who actually studies this. I talk about the experience with my aunt dying and going into hypnagogia. Uh, dream incubation, origins of Western medicine, lying in the human cult of Asclepius, and dream incubation is this great method of problem solving. Yoga Nidra, which like asana yoga is um, mentioned very ancient practice, although how we practice it now is kind of codified in the 60s and 70s. It's kind of a, a guided meditation that leads you through liminal dream space. Lucid dreaming and liminal dream 
Liminal Dream is a great bridge to lucid dreaming. And then um, Onerogens, which is anything that promotes really vivid dreaming. It might be an herb or a root, it might be a technology, mm. it might be practice, a lot of indigenous cultures uh, are working with Onerogens. So those are all the different chapters. You can dive in, you can read any one of those chapters. Not that you put them top, you can kind of skip the first one. Um, you can go in, you can just start read any of these chapters as it seems interesting to you and kind of roll around. And like I say, each chapter has a practice in it so that you can actually learn about these ideas, but then go in and, and try playing with your mind. Like your consciousness is amazing. Go in there and spelunk your inner worlds. That's really what this book is about, is like learning to go into this cool, weird space that you probably never thought about, but you can access quite easily, um, where you'll have these amazing experiences. Yeah, and I guess the, just the, uh, you know, I think I've given you a good slice of what I'm, what I'm doing in, in high weirdness, um, but to add one, one other element of it, uh, which is again, I'm thinking about the 70s, I'm trying to think about these amazing writers and amazing, amazing psychonauts, and how do we think and talk about the relationship between their writings and their experiences? And again, that too is another one of these Mobius loops. It's not, there's not a clear line between experience over here and writing over there. They actually end up looping around in all sorts of ways and using all, uh, all of my you know, harder skills to try to, uh, ex uh, ex not explain it, but open it up. Uh, but then the other thing that this, uh, I think is, is relevant to today is that there's these very interesting similarities between these experiences. And you're like, what's going on here? Why are they having these similar motifs of extraterrestrial science fiction, uh, media technology, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, uh, shamanism? What, what's going on, these weird mixes? And it, I think in many ways they were kind of like prophets, not in the sense that they saw the future exactly, but they were they were throwing their minds forward in, into the future. And in many ways, their motifs, their ideas, and their concepts are really uh, resonant today. And so I kind of speculate on why these things kind of weave together what it, said, what it has to say about the 1970s, but also what it says very much about, uh, about today. So even though it is in some ways a book about history, um, and these sort of liminal psychonauts, it's also uh, written very much as a kind of resonating uh, mirror uh, of our own contemporary experience. So I think we'll stop there, and, uh, and uh, thanks for your attention, and do, do some questions. psychological inflation, you may be messianic, 
and you're almost certainly deluded. <laughs> and yet, if you just go, oh yeah, I had this weird experience where I was just like one with everything and like got all these cosmic downloads, you know, kind of whatever, you know, what, what's on TV tonight? You know, that that's clearly not appropriate either. So what exactly, how do we actually work with Gnosis in a way where we don't fall into these, these traps and yet also take them very seriously? And one of the ways to do that is through writing. Is through the very process of trying to tell the story and sort of reflect on its multiplicity. So I think altered states are a way that allow us to navigate between faith and reason. You got to keep reason in the picture. You got to keep neuroscience in the picture. Down and dirty stories about social influences, cultural influences, privilege, all that kind of rational world, and yet moving in the direction of faith, but not with the certainty of faith. And so altered states become almost our, our vehicle for writing that, that in-between space where along the way, if we're lucky, we get gnosis. But then we gotta keep going. <laughs> One of the things that I've really learned with Minimal Dreaming is all of the different, and something I already knew, but has become um, so visceral, all the different ways of knowing Right, so a lot of the liminal dream practices that I have there about, or all of these realizations that people have had, inventions. You know, Edison and Dali both use the liminal dream space to generate ideas, and a lot of ways people have used this. Um, there are different ways of knowing. So your unconscious knows things that if you get your waking ego out of the way, you, you have access to these things, both in terms of what you already know, but don't know you know, or even in terms of healing, right? You go, you can go into your your body, mind can speak to you more clearly in, in these ways of knowing. Um, the body has memory. There's, I have some practices for recalling dreams and finding the wisdom that's in dreams by using body memory, getting into the positions in which you're sleeping and going into liminal dream space um, because where your body, we probably have four positions in which you normally sleep. You can actually rotate through those in the morning when you're in a liminal dream space and unlock a lot of what happens in the night. You can unlock childhood memory using liminal dream spaces because you get your this mind out of the way and you can start to go into memories that you've had, that you had in there and you just didn't have access to. So um, there's all of these different ways of knowing, different modes of knowledge, and our waking minds kind of only pay attention to one or two of them, you know? So, uh, you know, and again, if you're somebody who's familiar with psychedelics, you start to learn these different ways of perceiving, these different ways of knowing. It's very easy to unlock these ways. With, if all you have to do is use attention. So some of these practices really can get you into these different modes. Good question down front. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from Robert Anton Wilson, it's one I live my life by, which is perpetual agnosticism, that idea of continually saying, I don't know, to whatever kind of comes your way in non-simultaneous reality. Um, I think that's something that is touches a lot on this idea of liminal thought, but it's something that we might be losing in a world that is more binary and more technological. And with your background with technosis and with this kind of movement towards technology through the kind of, as like a psychedelic portal, we're having this weird transformation where this medium that was supposed to be kind of ambiguous and was supposed to be more perpetually agnostic is now becoming more binary and, and hard-coded. How do you feel that relationship is now impacting us as a, as a society and you know, in terms of our appreciation of the moral thought now that we're moving into this medium that is so on and off, that is so, yes or no, that, you know, it's very right, left. everything's so tense. Yeah, I think that, I mean, there's a, a couple things come to mind. Um, one is that I mentioned how, in a way, our world's becoming weirder, and then in another way, it's just, that weirdness is kind of banal. It's like we're in a banal eschatology. And I think part of that is because there is a disenchanting function of, of the digital. That there is something about the kind of clarity of just here we have it, more data, everything can be numerical, everything can be reduced into this kind of thing. And so even though technologies have, have fueled the imagination, fueled the visionary imagination, obviously the work of some uh, digital artists is incredibly visionary, yet 
one of the things that happens is that as you materialize the psychedelic experience, let's say, and make an incredibly awesome animation, it's like, whoa, that's just like DMT. That's cool. But you've also sort of captured something and rendered it obvious, rendered it overly clear, and, and sort of chased away the shadows. So we're chasing away all the shadows. And one sign of this culturally, I think, we see right now is as one of the, 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 the weirder ironies that we, we, I think we're in is that anybody who's paying attention, who has half a mind of critical thinking, recognizes that the world right now is incredibly fucking complicated and confusing. And it's only getting more so, right? The sources of knowledge, who do we trust? just the sheer complexity and acceleration of technology, our awareness of our embeddedness, and all of these you know, immense systems that have their own inertial logics, and we, the idea that we're like in control of our destiny is just impossible to think anymore, we're really in it. So it's very confusing. And yet, and yet, you turn to social media, you turn to people's discourse, you turn to political uh, language, Everybody knows what the fuck they're talking about. Everybody's sure about their perspective. This is the conspiracy theory that's right. This is what you should think. These people are racist. This is, uh, there's so much certainty. Why? Because people can't inhabit that I don't know space. And I don't mean the kind of like, there's a sort of um, snarky right wing form of the Robert Anton Wilson agnosticism now that you find that's, that there's, a, there's a danger to that as well. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Why should I believe that? I don't know. I should. Uh, maybe that. You know. So there's a way that it can protect you in a way from looking at some of the sh harsh realities of our moment. Climate change, for example, which is real, whether or not you want to like spin it this way or that. At least in my view. Uh, so there's some dangers with that zone as well. But I also believe very much that we can all use the required to, to, in my mind, really inhabit that. I don't know. There's a kind of harsh agnosticism where you use it to kind of put away things you don't want to deal with. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the vulnerability of being in mysteries and confusions and knowing it's really important and not going on to certainty. So I, and so when I think about that, like, where is that coming from? Part of it, I think, is, is the digital. Part of it is something about the way people try to concretize themselves in the midst of this very multidimensional bizarre situation of having our minds spread across the world instantaneously and that we're inside each other's heads all the time and we're hooked up with these you know, surveillance you know, AI devices that are leading us into these plots that we can't understand. I mean, it's a very strange time. And yet, so we, the only way we can deal with it is by like, being very certain about, the, I'm very certain about this now. So I think that's partly an effect of what you're talking about. And I think that's partly why there's also a desire to return or in any way we can to some kind of more analog experience, whether it's immersion in nature, whether it's listening to ind indigenous mythologies, or whether it's going into psychedelic space, which, which has a very analog aspect to it, very much of a sense of you know, these deeper zones of time. So I think that there are ways to balance that. It's a, I think it's a lot of what we're kind of seeking. Uh, but it's but it's definitely a different situation now, and it's different than it was in, in the seventies for sure. Just very quickly, um, uh, belief. Uh, I have a chapter where I talk about belief, and um, uh, one of spending so much time in the liminal zone uh, has really undermined my belief in something. My idea is that X or Y is true or untrue because I'm so much, I mean, and, and sure, that just gets to a moral relativism, you know, that is the, the domain of a lefty like me, absolutely. <laughs> but when you start to, you know, you have these, this space, like I was talking about between self and other, and where the, the experience that I am having is partly generated by the feedback loop between me and the rest of the world, you know, the kind of person that I am. I mean, nobody will deny that when you're like, like happy and newly in love and like getting laid, everyone thinks you look good, right? Like everyone knows that that's true, right? And nobody, and nobody pretends that you're happy, you're smiling, people, you know, you, you have a different world. So the, the understanding of the way that the experience is such a leap um, has, has kind of undermined any kind of stringent sort of belief 
And that starts, to, I feel like that starts to be a good way to move through the world, right? Looking for questions instead of answers. So speaking of looking for questions, we have just about five more minutes left for questions. So I'm gonna ask our question ask, uh, askers to just be real brief and get right to the question so we can accommodate as many as possible. Yeah, Jennifer, you had mentioned earlier when we were talking subtle allies. And I was kind of curious to hear a little bit more about what you meant by subtle ally. Subtle allies is a, is a phrase that we use for things where you have to step forward and meet the experience. So if you take 500 mics of LSD, it doesn't matter what you do, you're, you're, off, you're off, you're blasting off, right? But there are, there's a whole world of things. So onerogens, um, onero from the Greek dream, gen from the Greek to create, generate, um, are things that create really vivid dreams. A lot, there's a lot of herbs, there's a lot of roots, there's a lot of technologies. Um, I, I really, um, there's, he likes to work with um, Calamus, I like to work with Kratom. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, and, and Liminal Dream as well. There's a lot of things where you have to participate in the experience as much as whatever the substance is. It doesn't just hit you over the head. So I like to, I like Kratom. I'll take it, I'll have forgotten I took it, I'm walking through the city, and then I'm like, oh, look at the light in the tree. That's very beautiful, I'm a little bit high, I forgot about that. You know, but, but I mean, I have to actively participate. So um, I really love subtle allies at this point in my life because, um, because they require my active participation. No, I mean, just that uh, it's, it's uh, it's a way of bringing kind of uh, the psychedelic idea of an, of an ally, of a, a personal relationship with a plant substance or a plant spirit or even a chemical spirit, uh, into every day. So you you know you're drinking drinking your tea or you're smelling lavender. All of these things are, are actually subtle allies. They're just, they're not going to blow your mind, but they're mildly psychoactive. And in fact. All of reality is mildly psychoactive. <laughs> so starting to treat the idea, the model of the ally, and bring it into the, the, the rest of your life. OK, our next question's over here. Yeah, um, Eric, you were kind of speaking to this a moment ago. But uh, it's interesting. We've, we've, we've spoken this whole evening about liminality and haven't talked about initiation yet. So I'm kind of curious what both of you have to say with regards to liminality and initiation. And um, I guess the last thing I kind of want to add to that question is like, there was a, uh, a, a aim with those rituals. So I'm just curious what both of you have to say about that. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just talk about initiation in terms of my own experience. Um, and uh, is that part of, especially in our modern <coughs> existence, contemporary existence, that we're initiated in, in many ways, and we can, you know, I, I'm a Zen practitioner, and there's sort of an initiatory structure there. There's traditional rituals, there's invented magical rituals that take the form of, of an initiatory situation, even though it didn't exist 20 years ago. That's, that can be a real initiation. There's another kind of initiation, which is an initiation through books, through reading, through ideas, through encountering beings and, and one of the things that drew me to these writers is that all of their books for me and for many other readers are initiatory. They're not just like, oh, that's a story that was really interesting, got some ideas from it. It's like, whoa, that was, gets under your skin. You know, it gets under your skin. You, 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 heck, you, actually, you can't really go back. You know, you, you, you read the book. You've been initiated to a certain way of seeing. And for some readers, not all, but for some readers, it really sticks. We become Robert Anton Wilson fans and like I can't unbecome a Robert Anton Wilson fan, even though I'm critical of him as in, from where I am now in some ways. That period when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, reading a lot of that stuff was really initiatory. And so I believe in the initiatory power of writing, and indeed I kind of write initiatory books, at least for certain kinds of readers. So I think that initiation is, is really available in a lot of, uh, a lot of places, not just in traditional rituals or traditional religious transmissions and things like that and that. And it's part of this whole opening up to this allyship everywhere that is sort of saying initiations can be in dreams, they can be in books, they can be from teachers, they can be from your own experience. I write a little bit in the book about the figure of the shaman and the kind of community that we're in. I know people are bandy about the phrase 
shaman, shamanic, whatever. Um, but that said, so traditionally, shamans were people who were in the liminal zones, right? They were on the edges. They were the ones who could go back and forth between this world and the other world. Um, as a self-selecting group who are here for this, you probably are all people who are slightly liminal, right? You know, you're, um, you're a bit on the edges of your culture in terms of what you do and what you think about and where you are. Eric talked about books. So many of us found each other through books, sort of those of us who are kind of on the liminal zones of culture. So uh, practices, I always come back to practices. My book is about practices. Eric is talking about the practices that these figures have. And for people like us, the liminal people who often have become so in the world of books, starting to take on practices you know, whether you, whether you use mine, which are these kind of like endogic highs of, you know, going into these, um, into these stream spaces or whatever, you know, the subtle allies, whatever it is you take, you're taking your kind of role in culture and starting to turn that into practice. And that's an initiation of sorts in of itself. We're going to go slightly over time with questions. I have one very brief question here. Yeah, in... Smoking DMT and in dreaming, I've had this experience, this particular experience of passing through a channel, um, particularly with lucid dreaming coming out of it, the feeling of passing through a channel, and right before a breakthrough in DMT, passing through a channel. And I'm just wondering if you have any commentary on that channel space itself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, so a few things. Uh, when you talk, in my experience, when I'm talking about uh, liminal dream space and people who are familiar with uh, various psychedelic spaces, DMT is probably kind of the most familiar. That kaleidoscopic, swirling, free associative, non-narrative, you know, thought goes, you know, goes here, um, and uh, kind of going through the those channels where you can see so many thoughts at once, you can see the beginnings of all of these thoughts going through the possibility tunnel of you know seeing so much of what's happening in your mind. And those are the spaces that I really go to in, in the middle dreaming. So you're, you're getting this different view of your mind. Like sometimes I talk about the little threads that I can bring back from the little dream experiences, like trying to describe a wave by describing a drop of water. It's very hard. It's like a dancing space. It's very hard to bring back <laughs> descriptions of it. So, um, so it, I feel like it is a very, very similar channel in that way. But in the liminal dream space, you can you can do it several times a day, every day, which is nice. Um, and uh, and start to really break down that experience. It's and start to, because you have your conscious mind there, because it doesn't freak you out as much, and it doesn't have a body, then you can re really go through that. But I, I, I totally understand what you mean, it's very similar. Well, I think we can wind up saying that it's both experiences, the sense of a portal or a tunnel is the, the liminal, it is, that's the threshold. So it's almost like a topological expression of this mind that we're talking about. And so there's an abstract quality to psychedelics that are much harder to talk about than the content. Oh, there was this creature and it was trying to show me something and it had a treasure box that was full of puzzles or whatever. Like, okay, cool, I can sort of imagine that. But the multi-dimensional abstract geometrical portal that got me there, it's, it's pretty hard to <laughs> quite exactly know what to do with that. But that very challenge, and it's also true in dreams when you're trying to talk about, again, not the events, not the stories, not the symbols even, but the actual sort of phenomenological flow of the thing, that bringing more attention to those spaces is an initiation into liminal mind, into that ability to hold ambiguity, to hold complexity, to not resolve it through any irritable reaching after fact or reason. And that's, we can't do that all the time. We shouldn't do that all the time. We need to take stands and be clear about certain things in our spiritual lives, in our political lives, in our relationships. But uh, the capacity to be able to really become intimate with, those, with that quality of liminality, I think is a, is a really significant 
uh, part of experience, part of, 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 of being an explorer, and also as someone who's capable of withstanding very complex situations and not getting lost. So I think it's, that's, that's a wonderful place to, uh, to end. Be sure to come back to the Clinton Street Theater on September 3rd for Jordan Weiss. Let's have a round of applause for <laughs>